to the 11 o'clock service. It's lovely to see everybody. Um, 
If you don't know me, I'm Abby. I'm the curate here. Matt, who is the vicar, is having a well-deserved week off. So uh, he'll be back tomorrow. Oh, hang on. Oh, you see, we didn't practice this shot yesterday. He's on it. We've got a bit of droopy, droopy camera syndrome, but it's going to be okay. I'm just going to let Owen get on with it, and if you'll be able to hear me if you can't see me online. Sorry about that, everybody online. Who are now feeling seasick? Appropriate. It's, it's fine, oh, that's fine. <laughs> ah, two years ago, we wouldn't even have that problem, would we? Oh, strange, isn't it, the things we get used to. Um, yes, Matt's on uh, leave, he's back tomorrow, so uh, you've, uh, you've got me, I'm afraid. A um, uh, few notices just to go through, though. Um, as you will be seeing and sort of picking up, the coffee shop is getting gathering pace, um, Ali's been working her socks off this week, getting folders full of allergen information and health and safety and food hygiene and you name it, and intrepid volunteers have been powering through the food hygiene training. Anyone who looks about three times greyer this week, chances are they've been doing the food hygiene training online. Um, so we've all been commiserating with each other. Um, but we're getting through it, aren't we, Ali? I think it's yeah. fair to say, yes. We've got a great team of volunteers who are not taking no for an answer, so we're sticking with it. A lesson in perseverance this week. Um, so we are having kind of one last push. I don't know about anybody else who's joined in with the last couple of working parties. I found them quite fun. Maybe it's me, maybe I'm strange, but they're quite good fun to work together. And we're planning one last one before we open. Uh, so next Saturday, I think starting about 11 till hopefully only one, half one-ish, I would have thought we would finish by lunchtime, uh, late lunchtime, um, just to get things like the chairs scrubbed down so they're ready to go, uh, making sure that we have notice boards in place and the coffee, the food bank kind of place to put food bank contributions is back in place and maybe checking the, the cleaning cupboard and getting that kind of set up ready to go. Um, so that will be 11 till 1-ish, depending on how many people come. Last time was amazing. We had loads of people, and we were done dead quick with lots of things achieved. Um, oh, a little bit of touching up to do, apparently, as well. Okay, so Ali's got it all sorted. Um, if you are willing and able um, to come and help with any of that next Saturday, that's the 26th, please have a chat with me or Matt or Ali, and we would love to give you a job. Um, that would be great. Uh, thinking a little bit further ahead... Uh, in 10 days' time, uh, Wednesday, the 2nd of March, it's Ash Wednesday, so the beginning of Lent. Um, and we are marking that uh, with two services that day, our normal 10 o'clock communion, which always happens. Um, but then at 7 o'clock that evening, in person, on site, um, uh, an, an Ash Wednesday service with ashes. Um, I don't know if, if you've not met that tradition before. We, as a mark of our wanting to come to God during Lent in uh, knowing that we need forgiveness, um, we, uh, we can come and, and receive a, the cross, a cross made of ashes on our forehead. And that's something that we, we do here. So if you'd like to join us for that, 7 o'clock on Wednesday the 2nd of March in the building, um, that's the Ash Wednesday service with ashes. And then on that note... Um, if you're looking for something to do during Lent, something to focus your prayers or your, your kind of time with the Lord, then uh, Andrew Barclay has sent to small group leaders some really useful information, some really good, um, some good resources. Um, do have a look at those if you're a small group leader or in a small group. There are a couple of others um, the diocese are, are promoting. The first is the Archbishop of Canterbury's Lent book by Isabel Hamley called Embracing Justice. She came and talked to the Coventry clergy a few weeks ago about it. It's fascinating. It looks really good, kind of looking at different bits of justice um, through different parts of Scripture. Really interesting. And then the other one is living generously, thinking about what it means to live generously, which is another Lent course that Coventry Diocese is offering. If any of that sounds interesting to you as an individual or as a small group or as a group of friends who just want to try something different for Lent, um, then do by all means get in touch with me or Matt um, or Andrew and we will put you in touch and give you this, the resources that we have um, to help focus that prayer time during Lent. I think that's all the notices we need to have today. <laughs> that's enough. So, as you can see, we've got communion this morning and so we're going to prepare ourselves. We're going to, I'm going to pray before we stand and worship but... Um, 
prepare ourselves to meet the Lord in his word a little bit later and then at his table. Um, and that whatever age we are, that will be happening in one way or another. So let's pray as we prepare ourselves for that. Loving Lord, thank you that we can come to you, that you welcome us. And Lord, we ask that we would worship you wholeheartedly this morning, that we would hear you with ears fully open and hearts fully open, and that we would meet you as we come to your table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and worship.
Do take a seat. So we sang that everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a saviour. And we've come to that part in our service where we acknowledge that we need forgiveness, that we have done things, said things, thought things this week that are not part of God's plan for our lives. So let's use these words on the screen. I'll say the words in white if you want to join me in the words in yellow. And we'll say these words together. For the times when I have not worshipped you, Father God, I am sorry. For not giving you my best, Father God, I am sorry. For sometimes being jealous of other people, Father God, I am sorry. For not forgiving other people, Father God, I am sorry. For hurting people instead of loving them, Father God, I am sorry. For thinking I can hide my sins from you, Father God, I am sorry. Say together. As forgiven people, help us to live in the future in a way that pleases you. Amen. And may the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins. Heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We are a forgiven people. Now, Humphrey. He's here. Oh, and I'm doing a terrible job of staying in your shot. You just have to work around me. Okay. So, Humphrey, um, the, um, those of you who don't know, we, the way the Church of England works, it sets readings, and we don't always stick to those readings because we want to sometimes feel we, we've been called to look at other things, which is what we've been doing. However, at the nine o'clock, we usually have at least one of the set readings, and today's gospel reading, which we're not going to hear today, is about Jesus stilling the storm, which, in the light of the last couple of days, feels faintly appropriate. <laughs> However, I wondered, I remember... Sandra giving us some fabulous facts about Humphrey and how Humphrey is made for storms. Anybody remember how Humphrey is made for storms? What is it about camels? Stephen. They can close their nostrils so they don't get sand up. Lisa. The eyelashes are long because of sand. Yep, so the eyelashes are beautifully long. It's not just cosmetic. It's just a, it's about keeping the sand out of their eyes. There was one more thing I could think, remember. Go on, go deep. They can survive in bad conditions. Yes, there's something to do with their feet. Kate? Yep, so yep, feet, yep. So the way their feet work means they don't spread, don't lose their footing on the sand as it shifts in the storm. And I remembered one more, Paul. Three eyelids. Three eyelids, exactly, yes. So, so they can, and one of which is see-through. So they've got like their own windscreens, okay? And that, so that's, so storm, as camels are designed to withstand storms, to be resilient, even in storms as they rage around them. Doesn't mean the storms stop, but it means that they cannot get beaten down by them. Yes, there's something about it, some clever kind of, something to do with their fur that means that they don't get all, um, they don't get cold or get too, get too hot or anything like that as the storm rages around them. They are de brilliantly designed to cope with storms. And we're just going to think a little bit about this this, uh, this this morning, about Hannah and how she handled a storm in her life. And it didn't necessarily stop the storm, but how God helped her cope with it. So that's where we are. Anybody from the children's group like to tell us what's happening? Kate, you've got to take Humphrey out of the way. Right, excuse my hair when I take this off because I think I'll have helmet hair <laughs> or shield hair. 
that's okay. Oh, I'll be all right. Okay, so today in the Kids Roots, we're going to go out. We're going to have lots of fun. We're going to be talking about what's actually in our hearts and mm -hmm. what's going to happen uh, when we trust in God and we look to him for answers to prayer and, and that kind of thing. So we're going to have lots of fun. We are going to play Bible uh, musical chairs, if you've ever heard of that. Um, that should be fun. <laughs> Tell me more afterwards, children. I'd like to hear about that. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Children, would you like to go with Kate and the other volunteers? And we'll pray for you as you go. Lord God, thank you so much for our children here in this church. Thank you that they are such a vital part of our family. And just pray that they would have an amazing time together now, learning more about you and each other. Bless them and their leaders as they go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, uh, Helen, you wanted to bring our reading for us. Thank you. Did it even start? <laughs> Morning, everybody. So, the uh, reading today um, is taken from... Um, first book of Samuel, and it's about the birth of Samuel. There was a certain man from Ramathaim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once, when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Don't take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So, in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. 
she named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. This is the word of the Lord. your word. Help us respond to all you have to say to us this morning and into this week and the future. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to do something a bit different. I hope that's okay today. I'm kind of mixing up the sermon and the intercessions and personal prayer I'm having it all in one kind of big ball this morning, okay? Because this is less of a sermon and more perhaps a meditation on Hannah's story. It's part, it's coming to the end, in fact, next week will be the last one in our series looking at real lives, real hope in the Bible. And so I thought doing something perhaps a bit different today, allowing us to respond at different points through this might be something that would be helpful in light of all we've heard of Hannah's story already. So do get comfortable. You don't have to watch me. (laughs) Focus on the cross or on the candles, on one of the tapestries around us. If you're at home, maybe just get yourself comfortable. And let these words speak into your deepest places. Let God go there with you. There'll be moments of pause where I'll be inviting you to speak to God about where you really are. And I just pray that you would use them. I genuinely believe, as I've been preparing this week, I really believe that God wants to walk with us into those fragile parts of our hearts this morning, those places where the storms rage. And I pray we're able to let him. Hannah is loved. There is no doubt about that. Her husband cares deeply for her. And even though, as was so often the case at the time, he has another wife, Hannah was always his favourite. And she returns his affection. This is a loving, gentle marriage. More than a woman of the time might ever hope to dare dare to hope for. Hannah will know how blessed she is in this compared to so many others. But there's still something missing. In fact, more than that, there's a gaping hole in her heart, a deep, painful, never-ending longing in her that nothing can fill. And it's almost physically painful. No food or drink or relationship or work or property can satisfy her needs. Everything to her seems lost and fractured and wrong. So I asked this morning, where is the longing in our lives. It might not be the same longing as Hannah's. It could be something totally different. It might not be as acutely painful as Hannah's, but still maybe something is niggling away. The longing for a different career, a different way of life, for better relationships, for more security, for things to just, well, be different somehow from how they are. However much we tell ourselves and other people that we are fortunate, blessed, there is still no denying that that longing can exist and we can't fill it on our own. So in this moment, if you can, name that longing in your heart. It might be for a situation in the world. It might be for a situation closer to home. God knows it already just as he knew Hannah's. 
And maybe it's the first time you allow yourself to admit what you're longing for. So take this opportunity, whatever it is, now in this moment. Elkanah, Hannah's husband, he doesn't get it. He doesn't share the same longing that Hannah has. He has children by his other wife. That part of his life is fulfilled. And he understands it's painful to Hannah and she sees him trying to make it better. But there's just no way she can make him understand how difficult it is. He thinks he can somehow be her consolation prize. That somehow he can be the object of Hannah's love in place of the child that she so desperately wants. That he can be the person she should be pouring all of that emotion into. And she knows he means well. But it doesn't help. And worse, he doesn't seem to see the persecution she's suffering from his other wife either. Or maybe Hannah's just too kind or too loyal to tell him the extent of her hurt. Either way, he is just one of the many who have already told Hannah that she should shake herself out of it. That she should count her blessings. That she's lucky. He couldn't possibly know that every comment like that pierces her like an arrow. Because she knows how blessed she is in comparison to others. And she feels guilty for wanting more. But she cannot escape the longing. Are people around us not getting it? Like Hannah, do we feel guilty that they and other blessings in our lives don't make up for the longing that we feel? If that's the case, this morning, hear this truth so clearly. Your situation is exactly that. It's yours. No one else's. It's pointless comparing sorrow or trauma because you can only truly feel your own. So that's what you deal with. Don't heap guilt and shame on top of the pain of longing or loss. Or disappointment. So in this moment, take any guilt you might be feeling or any lack of understanding you're experiencing from other people, hand it all over to God. Let him carry that burden there for you. And they go to Shiloh and Hannah steps away from her family and she approaches the tabernacle because it's time to get real. To be fully, totally, unashamedly honest with God. She's willing to bargain with him. She's willing to do anything. And as she prays, her prayers become so intense that what had started as silent communication becomes passionate, visible pleading. But Hannah is not self-conscious. She's clearly either unaware or simply untroubled by how passionate her prayers have become. She's almost as close to the Lord's presence as she can be. Her situation is unbearable, but she trusts that God is listening to her. Listening well enough for her to be completely brutally, totally honest with him about how she's feeling. She trusts that God is big enough to handle her passion, her pain, her anger, her disappointment. She spares God no detail in describing how she's feeling. She doesn't fear his anger. 
She certainly doesn't seem to buy into the idea that he somehow sent the misery on her. She invests every ounce of energy she has in her prayer for him to step in, to change her situation, to fill that deep sense of loss and longing. Rather than turning away from him, Hannah has turned fully towards God, knowing that he is the only possible source of hope for her. She is so passionate that her prayers catch the attention of the priest on duty, Eli, and he accuses Hannah of being drunk. Tells her to sober up and sort herself out. Doesn't she know where she is? She's in the house of the Lord and her behaviour simply won't do. Yet again, Hannah is misunderstood. Her sadness, her hurt have been misinterpreted. And maybe in the past, maybe she might have apologised and scurried away, I don't know. But today there is something more resolute about Hannah. A new determination. Perhaps her passionate, honest prayers have given her a sense of hope, of faith, a sense that God is on her side, a picture of the love that he has for her. And she stands her ground with this elderly, respectable gentleman. Her passion is not to be confused with drunkenness, she tells him. She's pouring her heart out to the God she trusts to answer her prayer whatever that answer might be. Nothing is going to get in the way of that conversation anymore. She won't sit back. She won't stay silent. I wonder how passionate we are in our conversations with God. Are we a bit polite? Always looking for the right words to say? Have we given up talking to him altogether because it doesn't feel like he's listening? Or we lack the confidence he would ever listen? Well, understand in this moment that wherever we are, physically, emotionally, mentally, God is listening. He knows every hair on our heads. He knew us before we were formed. He knows everything about us. He's interested in every detail of our lives. Every disappointment as well as every joy. We do not have to put on our emotional Sunday best. Jesus removed all barriers between us and God when he took on human form, dwelt among us in our messiness, and then died and rose again for us. Even when he seems quiet, God is listening. He's not remote. So take this opportunity this morning. Make those passionate prayers a reality. Let go of that emotional Sunday best. That bit of us that thinks that church and faith are about somehow being polite or proper. Let's let ourselves pray those big, honest, brutal prayers that maybe we've worried about praying before now. God can take it. God will take it. He knows what we're about to say. Nothing will shock him. We don't even have to speak the words out loud. Hannah didn't. We can speak the words in our hearts and God will still hear us. And I believe he wants us this morning to be completely honest with him. So just take that moment now to do that. Hannah's story does have a happy ending. 
But actually, I'm not sure that happy ending actually is the son that she does end up bearing. She does have a son. He is a direct answer to her prayer, a key part of God's salvation plan. But I don't think he's her happy ending in this passage. Samuel's just a bonus. The happy ending for Hannah, I believe, in this passage is knowing that she has been heard. It's like she straightens up, wipes the tears from her cheeks, pulls her hair back into place under her veil. She walks away from her conversation with God and with the old priest, taller somehow, more confident, clear that she's been listened to. She eats. She's no longer worried about the provocation or the harsh words from her husband's other wife. Her face is no longer downcast, we're told. There's a lightness to her. And you know, nothing materially, nothing has changed in that moment. She still doesn't know if she's ever going to have a child. She still doesn't know if God's answer to her prayers is the one she wants it to be. Nothing has changed. But at the same time, everything has. Because Hannah is taking everything she was feeling, all the loss and the disappointment and the bitterness, and brought it without shame or fear to God. She has shaken off all her proper behavior and replaced it with honesty and trust and determination. In that moment, she has no idea how her prayers will be answered. But she has hope. Hope that God is listening and that he will handle her burden with care. And that changes everything. We may never feel like we get the answer we want to our prayers, our oldest, deepest, most desperate longings. But that does not mean that God is not listening. He's with us. He loves us. He sees the places in our hearts that are hurting and bruised and torn. He knows our worries and our fears. He knows what we long for. And as we draw close to him and trust him with the truth, He will carry us if we need him to. He will help push our shoulders back, lift our chins up. He'll help us walk that bit taller, safe, sure of the knowledge that he'll never leave us or forsake us. Trusting that he's big enough to handle all we feel and that he will gladly do so. So take this next few moments. Ask him to stay close as you keep trusting him with the reality of your own feelings, your own situations. And remember that Jesus died to make this relationship possible. The relationship of a parent who cherishes their child, whatever they're feeling, however they're acting. And he wants us to draw close to stay close and to know the hope of being heard. It's going to take a moment as you bring whatever it is you need to the Lord this morning. you stay in that attitude of prayer if it helps we're going to sing a faithful one which talks about God being our anchor in the storm 
about how we can call out again and again. Let's use these words, however is most helpful as you just spend that time with the Lord in prayer. Why don't we stand and say the words of the Creed together. Say what we believe. Let's 
say these words. We believe in God who made the world and loves it. We believe that he came to the world in the person of Jesus, who was both God and man, and who died on the cross so that we could be friends with God. We believe that Jesus rose from death and gives life to all who trust him. We believe that Jesus will come back and that everyone who trusts him will live with God forever. We believe in the Holy Spirit who lives in us and helps us to live as God wants. We believe in the church, people who live for God in this world. Amen. So Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and we share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share a sign of peace with one another from where we are. Children must be having lots of fun. <laughs> so they'll join us, I'm sure, in a minute. This is what God told us to do, what Jesus himself told us to do, to remember him, to remember all that he has done for us, to remember that we can approach him honestly, openly, wholeheartedly. We are invited to come to his table as we are, in all our brokenness, our hurt, our joys, our passions, and to meet with him in this. The Lord is here. The Lord. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. Do take a seat. On the night he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. So as we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, 
Make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. So as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. So draw near with faith. Receive the body of our Lord Jesus Christ which he gave for you and his blood which he shed for you. Eat and drink in remembrance that he died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen.
let's give thanks using the words on the screen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We're going to sing our final song now, it's, uh, When I Was Lost. We've sung it a few times now, so hopefully it will feel familiar to most of you. Um, yeah, let's stand to sing When I Was Lost. Thank you. 
peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let's say the grace together before we go. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Hallelujah. Have a great week and we'll see you again soon. That's who you are.